Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Stormwater Design versus Modeling, Back to Basics. Today, it's going to be myself, Ludmila Fadeva, and my colleague, Peter Coombs, presenting to you. Everyone who is attending this webinar is muted due to numbers of attendees, but you are more than welcome to use a question tool, go to webinar to ask us questions, and we will try to reply to them live uh, as much as we can. Chicken or egg, design or modeling? So what comes first? There is a question. We will try to answer it uh, today. We will speak about what is the main difference between stormwater design and modeling, how to choose which way to go, best tools available for design and modeling. Uh, first of all, uh, during preparation to this session, I asked Oxford Dictionary, what is the definition of design? A definition of design, a plan or drawing produced to show the look and fu function or working of a building, a garment, or other objects before it's made. So basically, design, the main purpose of design is to produce a set of documents to create something. Model. Model is a simplified description, especially a mathematical one, of a system or process to assist calculations and predictions. So model helps us in a simplified way to understand uh, a certain process and make predictions associated with that process. Today, we are going to speak about stormwater modeling and stormwater design. So everything we will speak about will be related to pipes, to surface water flows, uh, to different structures which uh, exist in uh, stormwater management. First of all, uh, I would like to start with infrastructure life cycle. So no matter uh, what type of infrastructure it is, if it's an open channel, if it is a pipe, if it is a pond, everything comes from a need. So before we create any stormwater infrastructure, we need to have a need. So the need can be a new road, a new development, or anything else which triggers a need to have a, a stormwater uh, infrastructure. Once we have a need, uh, first stage would be feasibility. We would try to understand how feasible it is to build something uh, we have a need for. Uh, it's quite cool, perhaps, to have an underwater town, but it's maybe not very feasible. Uh, there is, I believe, an underwater hotel which exists, uh, but uh, there it ends. We won't build, uh, build at the moment more underwater infrastructure. So when we speak about feasibility, we need to understand if it's actually possible uh, to do what we want. Once we define that uh, feasibility is there and we can go ahead, we will uh, go to a concept stage. Typically, we will have three to five, perhaps 10 options uh, of different site layouts, uh, of different types of uh, stormwater infrastructures. Uh, it can be SADs, it can be traditional system, it can be a mix of everything. And we will decide which option is the best uh, for the purpose in terms of uh, ease of construction, in terms of cost, etc. So once we have fixed our concept option, we will go to detailed design. And detailed design would be the stage where actually the set of documents will be produced, which will then go to approval. And after approval, it will go to construction, uh, where it will become a live asset. And once it becomes a live asset, it will be handed over to operation and maintenance team, which will look after it in the best way they can, till, uh, uh, till the system uh, reaches the end of its life uh, and gets uh, into either demolition or refurbishment process. So if it is refurbishment, we will go back to feasibility and think if it is feasible to refurbish uh, the system, if yes, we'll go for concept, detail, et cetera, et cetera, stage again. If not, we will just remove it um, and uh, perhaps build a new one. Why modeling covers all the stages from feasibility to demolition? Uh, uh, the reason is uh, that you start your model from a very, very beginning and you add up to it different, different items. And, and at certain point, you even can hand over your model to operation and maintenance team, and they can further look into it and run certain scenarios. And when you try to demolish a, a, a stormwater system, you need to understand how removing a system from the bigger scale will affect uh, the whatever is left. So if you are a uh, water company or local authority responsible for stormwater systems, uh, one big model of all the 
assets will benefit the operations. And it's very important to start it at the very, very beginning, uh, as then you can easily build it up and have, uh, by the end uh, of construction, have a great uh, asset model, uh, which can be used further. Yeah, thank you, Ludi. And so when we start looking at the design aspects, whereas with modeling, you're looking at the overall assets of a number of different developments maybe so the stormwater networks all combining together in one large model as you would do in the the modeling uh, with with xp swim when we look at design we're looking at one particular development and that will cover a range of those aspects within the life cycle coming from the feasibility of the development going through concept design and this is really where we've been lacking historically, and we're paying the consequences now because we've maybe not looked at the, the concepts that closely uh, pre-planning. We've focused uh, historically really on the detailed design just to gain an approval and to get things built. So we're trying to build in more functionality now to look at the concepts, of, which we'll show you later with uh, micro drainage. So the question has come about, you know, wh where does the design and the modeling kind of where do we use what aspect and how do they overlap when we start considering bim which is now being implemented across really across the whole of EMEA, europe middle east and africa that we cover um, that bim aspect also considers the operations and maintenance through to the life cycle so that there's, there's a increasing overlap between what we have to do at design stage now and then what the landowners and the clients are having to hold in their models of looking after their assets. So looking at the main purpose of design, this is to size something up um, as per legislation or the local standard. That's the key thing to make sure this is going to be technically correct. And we want to build this and design this right first time. The idea is that we, we, we have a robust solution, but we also value engineer to make sure that we're not paying any more for producing that particular result. So we need to cost engineer the item down right at the concept, right at the early stage. And once we've got the design right and we've valued engineered, we can then put forward to gain approval with the approving authorities, whether that be water company, local authorities, etc. And back to the Oxford English Dictionary definition, the outcome should really be the production of those documents to enable you to, de to actually construct clearly on site that approved design. So there's the definition that Lud Miller mentioned earlier on. And what we do with that is with the micro drainage, for example, software and the design software that we have, we design in the co accordance with whatever your local standard requires. We do this through setting up design criteria at the outset. I'll show you this live with the software in a minute. There's a lot of local, there are a lot of standards. Um, so we need to be flexible in what we, what we auto design. But also we, we need to consider those practical buildability issues as well. The practicality of the con contractor putting these in the ground or on the surface in, in, in the most cost effective way. And unfortunately, we, we don't just design something, get it approved, and then construct it. Um, there's a, a, a massive amount of editing required. There'll be issues that come up on site. We have to rejig things. So the ability to edit that information and auto redesign in accordance with that local standard is very important with the design packages. And those all important outputs as well to ensure that we gain swift technical approval and the contractor can construct this practically easily and in the most cost effective manner in the short term we need to take account of the the cost to construct the whole affordability debate and in the long term we need to take into consideration such things as climate change and the impact of our development upon the existing catchment and actually vice versa which is where i say we haven't really done such a great job historically but we're trying with the lasso guide very much looking to the future and, and the Welsh non-technical standard as well, encouraging us to look at the blue-green corridors, for example. So a good design will provide a long-term sustainable solution for those communities out there. In terms of modelling, main purpose of modelling to understand existing processes, and obviously we speak about surface water, so it would be the hydrologic cycle. So we 
need to understand a, it can be a local hydrologic cycle uh, as a site condition or it can be a catchment wide hydrologic cycle it can be before construction or after construction it doesn't actually matter because uh, through modeling software we understand uh, how does it work as well we replicate natural water behavior so for modeling software, we can uh, model how the water moves through the lands. Or for instance, if we speak about a river, if we would like to model a river with its flat plane, we need to understand how the river flows, how quick, how fast it is, what is the velocity, uh, what would be the extent of flood plane, so the extent of flooding, what would be the water depth, the water velocities, the hazard ratings, etc., etc., etc. So we are replicating what already is in there. We are not creating anything new with model. Uh, we replicate the natural water behavior or we understand existing processes. So last thing we use modeling for is understanding consequences of change. So at this last picture at the bottom right, we can see uh, black and blue water. So black water is before flood alleviation scheme, which consisted of two flood walls was installed. And blue water is after the flood alleviation scheme, which consisted of two flood walls was installed. So basically uh, modeling package enables us to demonstrate the consequence of change so we have installed new uh, flood walls this is what change it will bring to the community uh, back to definition uh, model is a simplified description right so we need to understand the hydrological processes we need to understand what we are modeling so re it requires understanding of, of the basics uh, Quality dot data is required to build a good model. Uh, we need to have a good data of rainfall, of digital terrain model, and infrastructure of both in underground and above ground. Uh, modeling software gives us no limitation on model creation. Uh, as Peter mentioned to you, in design software, we have design criteria, which can be entered, and then the design will comply with whatever criteria you add to it. While in modeling software, uh, you can pretty much uh, do whatever you like. For instance, if in design software, uh, it will limit you to self-cleansing velocity, which you will specify, and it will auto-design the system to meet the self-cleansing velocity. With modeling software, you can uh, lay pipes flat or even with negative uh, slopes, uh, as it is there to replicate the natural condition and, and uh, things may go wrong or, or things may be changed during construction and not always done as per original design. So with modeling software, you can add all these items. You need to validate and calibrate your model. So you need to uh, check uh, if you have any uh, rain gauges, if you have any gauges inside rivers or drainage systems. Uh, just to check the levels, to check the flows, to make sure that whatever you created uh, matches the real life. Once you have validated and calibrated a quality model, you can go through different scenarios. And you can add flood walls, you can add storages, uh, you can re-divert uh, your uh, overland, flood, overland flows, uh, creating, uh, through creating embankments on, on, or other items on the surface. So the output of modeling typically is used uh, to communicate predicted outcomes with stakeholders, right? So it enables us to communicate what may happen or to replicate what already happened and try to find a solution how to avoid it. In short term, term it enables us to manage site and catchment, immediate needs and funding. So going back to uh, the main stakeholders like uh, water companies or local authorities who are mainly responsible for taking care of stormwater systems. Uh, through modeling, they can understand where they need to uh, invest more money and where they need to invest less money and what are the immediate needs of certain catchments. So they can understand uh, how, how to deal with flooding. In long term, uh, it enables us to better plan and manage for future. So if we add all these little designs produced in micro drainage in one combined model done in XP Swim, then we can, uh, in 10, 10 years after, we can see a much better representation uh, of what is happening in real life. And good model provides a long term sustainable solution. Thanks, Judy. So, so what I'll do now, I'll, I'll take 10 minutes to show you micro drainage and really what we should be doing in terms of the concept design 
type of work, looking at the flow conveyance pre-development, and show how, how the system of microdrainage will automatically design in accordance with your local standard. I've got, uh, in true Blue Peter fashion, one that I've done earlier, but I'll start from scratch and, and go very quickly through the processes just to, to cover these aspects in about a 10-minute presentation and demonstration. Uh, once Peter will finish, I will open up XP Swim and I will take the same exact site which Peter worked on, but we will imagine it's 10 years down the line and the site was uh, already constructed. But uh, due to lack of maintenance, the pipes have been silted up. There would be some uh, uh, blockages so within the gullies and pipes and we will have surface water flooding. We will basically bring the micro drainage model in. We will create some results and uh, we will check for some solutions. So now I hand you over to Peter for a live micro drainage demonstration. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, so if we open up the micro drainage program, we can see that I've opened up the, the network aspect. So I have a, a range of modules all working simultaneously at the same time. I have the draw net module um, working, which means I can incorporate a, a CAD drawing. And I, I've also got the APT module working, which means that I, I can bring in um, three-dimensional grain data. Um, so to start with, let, let's click on a new stormwater network. We're talking about stormwater systems today. And here's that design criteria that I mentioned to you earlier on. So whatever your local standard is uh, and wherever you are, here's where we can set up that design criteria. Typically, we are designing our flow conveyance system for a relatively short um, return period, frequent return period, like a one year or two year or a five year return period. We can click on the map button and identify where we are. So we're, we're here in sort of, well, looking at the window, not so sunny Newbury, but here we are, clay, cloudy Newbury. Um, so I picked up the rainfall data for Newbury from the program based on Flooders, Floodsters report rainfall data. And I can now, on the right hand side, set up the design requirements. So what pipe sizes are we allowed to use? What manhole sizes are we allowed to use? These are preset in accordance with the latest sewers for adoption seven type standards, but you could you can rejig them to suit your own kind of local requirements in terms of pipe diameters, manhole chamber ring sizes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, looking down some of the other aspects here, the, the buildability issues that I mentioned earlier on, backdrop heights in manholes, minimums and maximums we can preset to get rid of any kind of crazy little backdrops where it's going to be more costly for the contractor to, to construct. And the minimum depth of cover under typically a highway, uh, what's the minimum depth of cover that you'd like to be constructing to? Um, if we put in 1.2, that's the optimum. Anything shallower, we would require concrete surround, which would be more cost. Anything deeper, well, you're excavating more and you're wasting um, fill money as well. So the optimum depth is set here. And as Ludi mentioned earlier on, the minimum velocity for auto design, the self-cleansing velocity when the pipe is full. So th these are the kind of key items that we can set up in the design criteria. When I say OK, I'm now looking at a plan view and I can load in a CAD drawing. So I just load in my, my CAD drawing. If it's a, a three-dimensional CAD drawing, that's great. So here, for example, we have a, a land survey that uh, has terrain data upon it. So I can bring that in. So we have a CAD drawing. If I run the mouse over the CAD drawing, at the bottom of the screen, little, little print, but you'll see Eastings and Northings and the grain levels, the Z coordinates. And I can put on a height map just to get orientated in terms of where's the high land, where's the low land. So it's high to the northeast, low to the southwest. That doesn't really identify the overland flood flow routes, but I can test that with the flood flow, which is also switched on here. So I can deluge the surface with a depth of water, 50 mil, see where it runs in five minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever we'd like to do. At the minute, the surface is grassy, it's rural. So if I just change that, run the analysis, and here we can see the main overland flood flow paths. So we have ponding up in the northeast, and then a, a major flow path running across the site. This is the kind of work that's now taken me about 60 to 90 seconds to run that we failed to do historically 
And this is the kind of work that would be invaluable if we can introduce into our future schemes and developments, because this is a particular project as a, a housing project, and we have to build in public open space. And that needs to be up to about 10, 15% of the land take is public open space. So if we were to utilize this blue green corridor as public open space for dog walking and building in a pond or a detention basin and a swale, we're having to provide that anyway. So we're gain, gaining some drainage benefit for no additional cost. Um, but what I'll do is I'll bring in the layout. So the way things work nowadays is this land survey would go to the architect. The architect would then look at this two-dimensionally, not three-dimensionally, and try to cram in as many housing units into that parcel of land as he can possibly gain, uh, and then give that layout back to the engineer to say, please make it work. Design the roads and the drainage systems and the foundations to the buildings and make this work for me. So let's bring in the CAD drawing that the architect has produced. Again, it's a, a DWG, so you can bring in DWG, D, DW, DXF formats. <clears throat> so here's the infrastructure layout. I won't bring in the levels from the CAD drawing because I have a, a ground model of the highway designed in a road design package. So if I just say OK to this, I'm essentially draping the new layout over the old land survey levels. So what I'll do now is I'll go to the site drop down and I'll bring in the GIS data, as we would, would call it, and refresh the ground model, the digital train model, with the final infrastructure levels. It's going to overwrite the existing train information, so I'll say yes to that. And when I say OK, it's going to prompt me to say it'll be sensible to re-triangulate the model, which I'm going to accept and say yes. So now we have the CAD layout draped upon a digital, digital terrain model. And if I just click on the view options to the left-hand side of the screen and show you the triangulation, here's the, the higher density of triangles showing you the camber of the road, essentially, under the CAD drawing. And if I um, switch off the triangulation, I could run the deluge again now. This time we have an urbanized surface, so it's more like a tarmac surface than a grassy surface. It's just the surface roughness that's changed. And we can now see where the overland flood flow routes are likely to occur even before we started to design the drainage system. So as I say, it would have been nice to have had like public open space maybe running through the middle, uh, whereas the architect put the public open space up in the northwest corner where essentially the majority of the the flow is bypassing it. So we've missed the opportunity there. That to one side, how would we go about the design process? Um, we know that the high point is in the northeast, the low point is in the southwest. So the outfall is via a pond in the bottom of the site. So we would design this flow conveyance system by using a little, tool, little toolbox. If I just zoom in here and pick up the toolbox. We have a, a drawing snap option, and we can automatically optimize to that 1.2 meter cover depth and the 1 meter per second self-cleansing velocity as we go along. And we can now design straight, they don't have to be straight pipes, they could be curvy pipes if we go around roundabouts and things like that. They don't have to be pipes, they, they could be channels, they could be trapezoidal sections, they could be culverts, all manner of means of things, but I will go with a traditional system because our hands have uh, essentially been been tied here and I just click on the on the CAD drawing what's happening now the program is picking up the eastings and the northings and calculating the pipe length at each click so I'm just going to click around here maybe come come down the road a little bit down to the next sort of junction and if I right click that's a pipe run. We can add in the branch lines. The program's automatically connecting everything up. What does this look like? On the long section view, it's setting the pipes all at 1.2 meter cover depth. There's a magenta line and a couple of yellow lines here. The magenta line is showing us the optimum depth of 1.2. At the bottom of the site where the rise in land occurs, you can see the 1.2 meter 
um, depth below the land line is the ideal but of course we need to put the pipes in at a gradient to provide a self cleansing velocity so if i look at the the stormwater network details we'll see that everything where the where the pipe is following the profile of the ground at 1.2 the slope of the ground is such that it's steeper than it needs to be in terms of self cleansing velocity but it's it's laying the pipe at 1.2 so we've got at least one meter per second self cleansing velocity down towards the bottom of the site you can see that we're hitting the one meter per second 1.01 meters per second um or automatically um, providing you with a self cleansing velocity. Now the pipe sizes are all 100 millimeter um, because basically we don't have any contributing areas. I would add in the contributing areas by defining them on the plan view. So we can do this by going to the tools again and defining areas. Once I've defined the areas, I can then also incorporate into into the system flow controls and storage structures um, how do i add the storage structures and the flow controls from this toolbox once more we can see that we have a range of online controls so we can hover over the controls and you can drag and drop them onto manhole locations basically where the flow control chamber will occur and the, similarly with the structures we can drag and drop a pond we can drag and drop a bioretention area, all manner of infiltration or attenuation structures can be drag and dropped into the, um, the uh, model. So that's the sort of concept of how we go about the process. If, now, if I now look at one that I've done earlier, this is a completed model. I can switch off the CAD drawing and you can see an array of, of pipes this is all the stormwater network with sustainable drainage systems incorporated there are a few little pink dots in here and there are some little triangles indicating that we have some manner of structure uh, in the model and we have some manner of online control if i put the cad drawing back on and just show you the network drop down we can see that there are some online controls hydro brakes complex controls controlling the discharge off-site back to greenfield discharge rates. And we have a range of structures that we've managed to kind of fit into the, into the model. So we have porous car parks and we have a, a complex structure. And if I look at the complex structure at the downstream end, it's an infiltration basin with an infiltration trench beneath it. So what I would do, having designed this, I would now run an audit. So if I'm a local authority or a water company, but local authority typically nowadays would need to look at the pre and post development discharge rates and discharge volume. I would run the wizards and the discharge wizard in particular is the one that I'm thinking of. And what will happen now, we can go through a step by step process to test our network against a range of storm durations. A range of return periods one year that we designed the flow conveyance to 30 year for the no flood 100 year plus climate change that's saying 30 percent we could check for 40 percent whatever the requirement is to uh, ensure that we don't go beyond that we don't create flooding that goes off site we need to control and manage the surface water flooding within the confines of the site so another thing that we've been very poor at um, historically and we're now paying the consequences. And here are the Greenfield pre-development discharge rates for the one year, the 30 year, and the 100 year. And also, we've, we've got a, a benchmark on the volume of Greenfield runoff that's, that's occurring. So there's a Greenfield runoff volume, and we could also, if it was a Brainfield site, calculate the Brainfield runoff and apply betterment, uh, which is what I've done here. So if we run the analysis, the results will come back and it will tell us whether we're passing or we're failing. So this is all about the approval process. Um, the, here's a summary. If we look at the discharge rates, we can see that our post-development discharge rates are just uh, beneath the pre-development discharge rates, the greenfield discharge rates that would have been calculated for the site. 
the volume of runoff um, post development is less than the pre development runoff volumes. So that again is a, a tick in the box. Minimal discharge, this is for the first five millimeters of um, flow, the first flush that occurs on the impervious surfaces. We're getting, as much as a failure, but we're getting 20.9 liters per second flow generated for the first five millimeters of rainfall that lands on the system. And from here, um, what we would do in terms of outputs, we would um, produce the plan views. We can click on the, the, the plan preview, set the scale, plot off the, the plan view. Uh, we can also extract the long sections. We can also uh, run a range of different reports through the print options. And those summary details of the discharge wizard would come out of that. Uh, we could also extract the setting out information and provide the plan, the long sections, and the setting out information to the contractor. So I'll hand you over back, back, back to Ludi, who will run through a sort of 10-minute demonstration on modeling with XP Swim. Thank you, Peter. So let's imagine now that this uh, lovely site Peter just designed for us has been constructed. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, due to lack of maintenance, been flooding. So 10 years after, uh, I'm tasked to uh, do some modeling and understand uh, uh, what are the extents of the flood and how can we, in a cost-effective way, quickly fix it. Uh, what I would do first, uh, after opening XP Swim, uh, first item, I would add a topography. So topography, I would add on, under DTM, and there are different ways uh, and different formats of topography uh, which can be added. Uh, I already have my topography, uh, which was which came through X, Y, uh, Z format. After adding a topography, I would like to add a cut uh, file. So again, I can just right click on a layer and say load cut data. Oh, I have my cut file available, uh, so I just stick it in. Uh, at this point, I would untick the topography uh, as it's a bit bright for me. So once I have my cut file, uh, my initial plan, I would like to import the micro drainage model. So if I click import micro drainage data, I can choose a micro drainage file and import it. So you can see this is um, exactly the same network. If we go back to PITS file and if we remove the cut, so this is exactly the same network which was created by Peter. On When we import micro drainage files, the rainfall data comes through. So what I want to do next, I would run the analysis to understand where the flooding is occurring. So if I take maximum water depth to see where the flooding locations are, I can actually uh, see that this is uh, what has been happening, and if I play it live, this analysis were done for over 24 hours. But I know uh, by heart that I believe my flooding was about uh, eight hours, nine hours. So if I just play it step by step, I will be able to uh, see which manholes are actually flooding. Uh, on the map. Obviously, you can see that as well through uh, the tables and graphs uh, which are available in the software, or you can just uh, see it through the map. So, uh, in here, uh, I did identify that a couple of manholes were flooded. So, apart from uh, water extents and water depths, I could choose uh, to display uh, velocity vectors, and actually, I can uh, as well, ask the software to tell me uh, the result values. So then for each and every uh, cell in the software, I will be able to see what is the velocity. And uh, I can basically uh, see uh, how, how does it flow. What I have identified through uh, a very quick analysis is uh, that uh, there are a few buildings flooded in here. Uh, there are a couple of buildings flooded in there, so if we count it, it would be uh, one, two, three, about four plots are flooded, and maybe uh, one, two, 
three plots have some uh, garden flooding, but which doesn't affect the building itself. So what I would like to do now, I would like to do uh, a quick solution which uh, for which I created a scenario. So through the scenario manager, I can easily create or delete new scenarios. Uh, I created scenario one, and in that scenario, I have introduced I have introduced uh, a layer uh, which will represent the curves. So uh, this red lion which uh, I have on my screen. Uh, this is a line which I draw on a curve location and I decided uh, that I will test it for channeling the flows option. So because uh, the locations of flood are uh, these two manholes, manhole number nine and uh, manhole number eight. So I would want to try to channel the flows uh, to make the curve higher and to channel the flows and basically redirect them from the location of where it is flooding to some other location. But I will only do it for this uh, couple of streets. So basically I will do it along here and along there. And I will just channel up uh, completely the internal side of this block and we will see what happens. So what I did, I draw this line and I gave it an adjustment to an elevation of 300 millimeters. So basically it will take the DTM uh, level and add 300 millimeters on top and create uh, an adjustment to DTM 300 higher. So in a way it will introduce a little curve at the edge and we will see how it will affect. So if we now click maximum water depth, what we can see is a completely different picture. Uh, inside um, this block area there is no flooding at all, and a couple of buildings which were flooded in here are dry now as well. So we can still see some puddles in here, but there is much more water on the west side of the site. So if I now quickly uh, switch in between scenarios, and if I concentrate my eyes uh, on, on, on the uh, west side of the site. We can see how amount of water changes. In the base scenario, there are only few properties flooded, and in scenario one, uh, we will see uh, much more water uh, within this location. So basically, yes, we did redirect the water from uh, central side of the site towards the west side, but the water doesn't go anywhere because the volume of water flooded is exactly the same if it, if, as it was before. We just redirected the flooding from one area to another area. So through modeling software, you can easily test and check options. How introducing certain flood alleviation uh, items or even raising up the curbs can affect the flooding. So obviously, in this case, what I would need to do, I would just need to channel up perhaps more streets uh, and uh, direct all the water towards the pond location where it will just freely uh, flood uh, some gr green area uh, without affecting any properties. But to remove the flooding from the buildings. And uh, basically that's it uh, from me for today. I will hand you back to Peter. I hope that was useful in terms of trying to understand the differences between why we use microdrainage for new design and XBSwim for modeling those existing scenarios so that you can both design and model with confidence uh, I, I, whatever your requirements are. Uh, looking ahead this month, um, towards the middle and end of the month we have uh, microdrainage training coming up between the 18th and 22nd of July. I'd recommend you to go take a look on the website to book for either the microdrainage training or the XP swim training which is happening between the 26th and 28th. I'm not 100% sure on the availability, I think some of the courses are already full uh, on the micro drainage, but have a look online. If they are full, then you just won't be able to, to book. Um, they'll have been taken off the website. Thank you for your attendance. And thank you all for your attendance. I look forward to engaging with you again in the future. Take thank care. You. Bye bye.